Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's conversation on the YouTube Creator Sub Podcast. Dusty here, as always, joined today by Faith Womack from the How to Faith a Life YouTube channel, which as of this recording has 172,000 subscribers, almost 750 videos. So she's been doing it for a while and it's got a great community over there. Let me tell you a little bit about Faith. Faith is a Bible nerd who seeks to empower Christians on how to read and actually understand and enjoy the Bible. Through sharing what she learned in undergrad and seminary, Faith serves Christians who want more from their Bible studies, and she's taken that to her YouTube channel to great success. So Faith, how are you doing today? Great. Thanks for having me on. It's such an honor. Absolutely. When we were talking off air, you mentioned that when you were starting or early on, you listened to the podcast. And so I get that a decent amount. And when I hear that, it just means a lot to me that successful creators like you have picked up the podcast and have used it as a tool along the way. So that's really cool to hear. Now, let's talk about the start of the How to Faith a Life YouTube channel. So go back to the beginning. What was the origin story of the channel and how did it all come to, to happen? It started out um, me just being really lonely. We had moved out. My husband's a pastor. And so we'd moved out to a rural area and I didn't really have any friends and was getting to know people, but just like really struggling from going from a really tight-knit community where I had a lot of friends to all of a sudden in this rural area. And I just had a lot I wanted to share and talk about that I'd learned in undergrad. And my husband and I were trying to conceive and had some miscarriages. And so I really started out talking about mom stuff. And of course, my faith and stuff that I'm interested, stuff I'd gotten degrees in, kept coming up. And slowly, eventually, like after probably a year of making videos, I actually discovered Bible study YouTube and mm -hmm. this world. And it's if anyone's not a Christian listening, they're probably like, what? There's a niche for everything on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And so discovered that and leaned hard there. I was like, this is what I want. This is what I want to talk about because yeah. it has changed my life. And really just went head for first into that and wasn't really sure what would come of it, but I committed myself to, I'm going to do this for at least a year. And this will just be a fun little thing. I just want to try. I always wanted to learn how to edit videos. I thought it was a cool skill and very cool, like creative outlet. I was like, I'm just going to do this. And eventually got pregnant, had a baby and I was home all day, just not twiddling yeah. my thumbs, but mm -hmm. I had a little bit more time and just was stuck at home with a baby right. and had like this pent up mental energy. I'm the kind of person that always want to have some kind of project going. I'm creative. And those things give me a life. I guess I'm type A and then I want to check stuff off my list. Like I want to feel like I'm doing something with my life. And it like, I think in a lot of ways, my YouTube channel saved me from like really bad postpartum depression because it gave me that creative outlet. And then I slowly started to make these stranger friends. I remember telling my husband, honey, 30 people watched my video yeah. and they're so nice. And they were saying all these wonderful things and getting to know them by name and recognizing their little pictures pop up with their comment and stuff. That's really how it started out. And then of course, here I am, I guess almost seven years later or more. Yeah, I guess seven years. And it's, my whole job. So. That's awesome. Yeah. You, like I said at the top, you got 172,000 subscribers. Yeah. YouTube's interesting, like you mentioned at the top there about there being a niche for everything. Whenever I get into a new hobby, my wife says that I, I'm, I'm really good at getting into hobbies. Recently, I got into just reading a lot, just reading my Kindle or just something that I, I haven't done uh, very much. I've always been a, a kind of a, a small reader in sense of the time consumption in my life. But I discovered that there's this whole thing on YouTube called like BookTube where people are going and reviewing books and doing this thing. And I just went deep into that thing, right? That's what YouTube's so good for. You get into a new thing, a new hobby, or something that interests you, and you can dive as deep as you want to go. And that's the beauty of YouTube. I love that. Now, what was the most, I would say, the most surprising thing to you? You mentioned like these people watching your videos and being so nice to you and interacting with you in the community. What were some surprising things that just took you maybe off guard early on and maybe even now with being an influencer? influencer and a creator on YouTube? Yeah, I think it probably would be like the community and truly getting to know people online through just comments and them giving me life advice. Maybe they're older in life or younger or, you know, there's just so many different angles of so, so many different people that I've gotten to meet online. And like I was raised in the South in very Christian circles. I, you know, I wouldn't like most of these people I would never get the privilege of knowing. We would mm -hmm. walk right past each other in the grocery store. And so I was like really early on surprised by like the doors it opened to make friends that I would never 
otherwise get to know. And many of these people eventually became my patrons. And now like some of them have my personal phone number and we text mm-hmm. like that. This has changed my life in that way. I always was more of an introvert where I'm going to pour myself into three friends, but then that kind of maxes me out and I want mild, deep friendships. And I feel like the Lord really provided that. Um, and really YouTube gave me the opportunity for that because you they're watching your life and they're responding and giving advice or writing you an email. And I think there's a lot of that, especially when you're a smaller creator. I know so many smaller creators, they want to grow big, but things actually get shallower when you go, get bigger. You just can't share as much. I can't share what school my kids go to. I can't share what church I'm at be just for security reasons, Mm -hmm. but that automatically sets like this distance from me and my audience. And I definitely look back and miss those days where things were smaller and um, I could be more vulnerable and all of that. How do you foster and grow and nurture and all of these words? How do you do that to a community that you've grown online through YouTube. What are some tactics that you've put in place, some strategies that you've seen work for you that help you really foster this community and take them along with you as you go through like the pregnancy stuff and you're sharing your faith and all of these intimate details? How do you set the barriers and the guardrails, but still have a community that trusts you and engages with you because they feel like you're being real with them? Yeah. Um, Okay, so Emma Chamberlain did an interview with Colin Samir, and she mentioned something that I really resonated with. She said, I've been always the type of person where if you start to misunderstand me, I'm going to over explain because I know my intentions. I know I'm a good person. And so I will always, she's basically said, she's always going to be vulnerable. She's always going to be really open and probably overshare with people because that's just how she's wired. And I'm very similar. I don't know if it was like the drama or whatever that shaped me in my childhood or whatever, but I am always the type of person, like I will always overshare, be super vulnerable with people because I know I'm not like, I don't have necessarily anything to hide. Now I will definitely like try and protect my kids and not share like where our church is or their school. But I think... I think people really are looking for vulnerability online. I think they want to see you be real. And a lot, I think a lot of adults are lonely. I think a lot of people go on YouTube and they want to feel like they're talking to their girlfriend or a close friend. And they want to hear your intimate thoughts about your garage organization or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like they want that buddy relationship. And I think we need it. And in some ways, YouTube does help meet that on the surface level, or at least start to meet those needs. I was watching a video yesterday as I was prepping dinner and it was some girl I've never even talked to in real life, but she was just going on and on about how what makeup she uses and how she hasn't gone makeup shopping in a long time. And she doesn't really care. And I was like, I have no reason to be interested in this, but I am. And mm-hmm. it just feels like I'm not alone in the kitchen right now making dinner, but that I have a girlfriend in the room with me and I'm listening to her thoughts. And it's just, it's whatever that is, whatever relational yeah. itch it, it's met. So YouTube's such a powerful tool in that it can be used for business. It can be used for personal. It can be used for entertainment. There's so many different avenues. That's why I love doing this podcast and talking to creators like you. Now, on the end of that answer, I do want to piggyback off that and go into the things that you've done maybe early on or even now that you think have attributed to the success of the channel. Because whether you want to admit it or not, the channel is successful, right? A lot of creators are very humble and they're like, oh, I only got this, that, whatever. Bottom line is you're in the top five, four, four or five percent of creators on YouTube, not just in numbers, but just like attrition, right? Most creators like fall off after year four, after year five, right? Because they're just not willing to put in the time and effort it takes to get to that successful point. So what are some things that you've put in place with the YouTube channel that can be technical or not that you think have attributed to the the, the growth of the channel and the success? I, I, okay. So I never came from it. Like I have to make this a business or my life. In fact, I would, I like doubted it more than I ever saw like it happening, but I was like, I'm at least going to try. And posted and posted and posted and posted and tried to always increase, get a little bit better 1%, always try and get my thumbnails a little bit tighter, my, mm-hmm. my titles a little bit better, all the things. And I look back and I can see that growth just, it's like a ball and how the improvement is like a ball. And while trends of thumbnails change and title trends change and all that kind of stuff does eventually evolve on YouTube. I think just the attitude of being a student like forever is something that 
And like the attitude of not holding anything too tightly is something that's so priceless on YouTube is you don't have to make money from this, but you're just going to be here no matter what. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to get 10,000 views, but you're going to try your best and you're going to do your best. And I think those kinds of things have always helped. I also would say too, I wasn't afraid to monetize early on. I'm not like a money driven person. I've never been like a businesswoman or anything like that, but I get, did get degrees and had student debt. And I was like, it would be awesome if mm -hmm. like these Bible studies I'm posting online could eventually pay for my student debt, right? Like you, at least in my theological circles, women don't typically get employed by churches in paying roles. And oftentimes they're just volunteers and such. And so I was like, this would be the perfect place to use what I've gotten degrees in anyway. And so I started a Patreon page. And I think because there was funding behind it, that also gave me more ability to spend more time to, to hire editors to pay for courses or advice and things like that. And I also have like just the personal call and desire to reach people with this thing that I believe to be the truth. And I genuinely will like just out of pure passion, want to stay up till 3 a.m. editing and perfecting the intro or whatever it is. And so I think all of those combined leads to a really great, healthy environment of just wanting to do my best and staying like a student. Okay, this totally flopped. This totally failed. It didn't do how I wanted it to do. But also look at all these comments. It reached them in a different way than really mm -hmm. what I wanted, but maybe deeper. Right. And now I've learned all this priceless stuff I wouldn't have learned if it didn't fail. Yeah, there, I touched on multiple different things. No, there. I love that. That's a great answer. And I want to follow that up with like, how did you get through the tough times? The times when early on you were thinking, is anyone watching does it matter? Was it, you obviously have a great attitude about, hey, I'm not doing this for the monetary reasons. I'm not doing this for any other reason than I have a message and I want it heard and YouTube is that tool or vehicle to get me there. But sure, certainly there were times when you thought to yourself, could I not get better return on my time somewhere else? We've all been there. I'll be honest with you. There's times with my YouTube channel, even recently with it doing well, where I've thought to myself, what can I do to, to get to that next level? Or am I putting my time where it needs to be? So how did you get through those difficulties? To be completely honest, I think it helps that I have faith in someone that is the creator and sustainer sovereign over everything. And so I get to just be like, okay, so that wasn't meant to mm. blow up. And I believe God's in control of algorithms or even comments when they go sour. And like, I my value isn't placed in those things. And so I can just lay my head at night knowing like I'm on this journey, like just trusting the Lord. And if he won't, the Bible uses this imagery of a clay pot. And I think this is adaptable to anybody, no matter what faith you have. But if I'm just that clay pot in his hands, like even if he crumbles it up, I'm still in his hands, right? Even if he shapes it weird, how I don't want to be shaped, like I'm still in his hands and there's nothing that can take that away. Right. I'm not, it's not like my safety is lying on this doing well or anything like that. I just have this security that's not placed on performance and things like that. And so I think that helps. But I also would say at the end of the day, I am the type of person that's going to give my 100%. And so when things didn't go well, at least I knew I tried my best. Um, and all of this, obviously that's like relative. I was like, how do you know you've tried your best? And there's always a pushback there. But relatively speaking, like realistically, I did my best. And I gave it my all and I gave it my heart. And if that didn't sit and resonate with people, then like it will eventually in a different form or a different way. But at least I did my best. And I think a lot of people, especially nowadays since 2020, really now that we're like, we're thick into 2024. And I think a lot of people have this idea about influencers and you either grow boom and it's super easy or and you're, it's just handed to you on a silver platter or it's not cut out for them. And so they like try for a month and then they quit when it doesn't go easy. And I'm the type of person that's, I was plowing for like years and years and still am in a lot of ways. It still feels like I'm trudging through mud and I'm okay with that. Like I actually want to live my life like that. I want to die tired. And I always tell people that and people whatever, but not like in a pick me kind of way or a pat myself on the back, but I don't know. I've like been given this life and I, I want to pull the all-nighters if I can. <laughs> I want to give my best because I don't want to die having anything left in the tank. Mm -hmm. I want to give like my all. And so if YouTube's like the best way to reach the most amount of people and to serve the most amount of people, then let me give my all there. And obviously my home life, my kids, my marriage, all of those things are super important to me as well. But I think people don't realize that's 10,000 souls. That's 10,000 brains, or even if it's just 10,000, or if it's like a hundred, like that's a hundred people. You couldn't have talked to that many people in the grocery store today. Like 
that so many people just with like one five minute video or one yeah. 15 minute video, whatever, might as well make it like pretty good. Like give like as much as you possibly can to it. And so I'm not a perfectionist by any means, but I am pretty passionate about like trying to do my best because this is my legacy and it's going to outlive me probably. So sometimes we do lose, lose the perspective of the power of the numbers on YouTube, whether it's 50 people, 50,000 people, my channel some days gets 40, 50, 60,000 views daily. And that's a lot of eyeballs. I remember early on, I was going to school to be a teacher. My wife's a teacher in education and a little discouraged. I had a job out of college and then got let go due to economic reasons and just that company dissolving. And I realized I was like, I don't know if I want to be in a classroom. I heard all the horror stories from my wife and someone told me it might've been somebody in my family mentioned to me or close to me said, Hey, you're getting thousands and thousands of people that you're teaching online every day anyway. So you're just getting to do the teaching just in a different avenue or a different platform. And so thinking of it that way sometimes puts it a little more in perspective. Let's talk about the technical side of things for what you do now. You talked about like you wanted to get good at editing. You wanted to get better and more efficient. So talk about the video production process for you, how it's evolved over time. And just from start to finish, like from ideation to publish and post publish, what are you doing for your videos? I've learned, I've been trying to lean more into like when I get a good idea, oftentimes it's three all in the same hour. I get three really good ideas and I'm super excited to film them all and I need to jump on that and do that or else I'll eventually talk myself out of those ideas or lose the passion for them. And so that's the part of like us being creative people is we have to lean into that and stuff comes in waves and you don't want to just like, I don't know, I've learned like almost sometimes pacing myself isn't always great with the creative stuff because you want to lean into those creative waves because there will be a dry period and you want to have those videos built up and stored up ready to edit and stuff so i'll film in batches like last week i filmed for just youtube channel videos i filmed probably like three videos i think or four and then this week i don't even want to talk to a camera <laughs> so you know that's just like life right it might be hormones too i don't know <laughs> but that's life and so i'll film i send them off to an editor guy and he does like the first cuts i film on two different cameras that's just like where i've evolved I might add a third coming up soon, but a lot of my content is like talking head with also like B-roll on my hands, doing something in my Bible or writing down something or showing something in a book or a resource. And so right now I have two cameras and that's what works really well, but I'm still spending a lot of time like moving the tripod, changing the camera angle and all of that. And so I might even still bring in a third. It's just that gets complicated too, because it's more memory cards to keep that's track right. of. Mm -hmm. And golly, naming memory cards, like why don't they make them where you can like label them better? Like the, that's a whole thing. I should just make my own product, but whatever. So yeah, I'll send all that through just like Google Drive to an editor I found on Upwork. And he's very like-minded, really easy to work with. I try and pay the people who edit for me like a well above minimum wage or like where, where it's worth it. So that when I send them footage at 9 p.m. and ask for it, like within 24 hours, I don't necessarily feel super bad because they're like, yes, I want to work for you because I get paid so good. And so I send that to him. He does first rounds of edits and gives me back like a rough draft of sorts. And then I go through and I add the pop-ups, the zoom-ins, the personality to the edit and the final touches. And with what I do, there's like a lot of like teaching and you want to teach stuff that's correct and with theology but quickly can get into heresy and stuff like that and so i'm like really fine tooth combing through that but he saves me probably i used to spend probably like 12 hours on a video and now i spend like probably half that sometimes it's even as low as three four hours just depending on the type of content that it is that's like the process and then typically i already have a rough idea of the thumbnail but as i'm editing the video i kind of fine tooth that i, I spent so much time on this i should probably mention this in the title or the thumbnail just again because of the nature of the content that i make but i try and typically have a title and a thumbnail picked out and then that kind of evolves with the process of the video and throw it up on youtube and hope that it sticks <laughs> <laughs> do you design your own thumbnails yeah uh, just yeah. on canva yeah sure um, I don't spend that much time on them. I really honestly want to get more passionate about thumbnails. But right now I don't like YouTube. I don't know if you feel this way, but I feel like YouTube 
right now on thumbnails is so divided. Like each niche has their own style to thumbnails. Yeah. And some of them are like stuck in 2005. And then some of them are like very 2010s era. And then some of them are like, I don't even know what this is. Maybe it's 2020s, but like everybody has their own style and it's weird. Back in the day though, it was like everybody made thumbnails this certain way, yeah. the white outline around them. And it's just not that way. I, I think that it's like anything else, right? It's all about trends and what's working for the people at the top and it just trickles down. So what ever Mr. Beast or Casey Neistat or any of these really high-end creators that are getting a lot of views, whatever they're doing in testing, that's what most people are going to. It went through a trend where people thought to themselves, I have to put my face in my thumbnail. It's got to be really big and bold. It's got to have the outline around, just what you were talking about. And I think that now we're seeing that there's other trends coming in. There's like the the comparison thumbnails of the $0 versus the $100. There's the, the all of these things that are trending. And I think you have to find what works for your brand, what works for your channel. And it oftentimes may not be the most popular thing. It just is what's working for your niche and your space. And I think that the only really trap you can get in is just not evolving and not trying to get better with everyone that you do, like with anything on YouTube. So I appreciate you walking us through that. It's interesting you say that you hired an editor. How early on in the process of the channel did you do that? Mm, I had two now both happen to be males. One was like international. And so it got hard sometimes to communicate things, but eventually I just, sometimes I have to take back on the editing because I will lose like creative, I feel like creative power, creative interest. And if I go back to square one and just start editing everything myself, it gives that back to me and it like feeds me sometimes. But I go through cycles, that's just creativity, I think. But I think it was like three, four years in, I got into it. And I think we did it by video then. I would pay them like an a uh, hundred dollars for per video. Sure. Um, and now yeah. I do it more hourly because videos are so different on my channel. One might take three hours, another might take ten. But yeah, I just on Upwork. I really like Upwork. I don't know why I don't like Fiverr. I can't remember, but. Yeah, there's a lot of ways you can go about doing it. Upwork, a lot of ways that I found people recently, a guy on my team that helps me with some, I have a podcast production kind of studio here where I edit podcasts for people and the guy that edits for me works for me. I found him on LinkedIn. So it's just, <laughs> it's one of the things to where it's just like, hey, you can find people. I found people to do work for me and my YouTube channel, some research for the podcast on a comment section of a video of mine. I like, I'm, I found him, went to his channel. He didn't have anything. I, I've somehow tracked down the way to get in touch with him on social. And he's still doing some kind of back end data stuff for me for the podcast. So uh, you can find people anywhere and everywhere. It's just the, the ability to, it, it takes time with anything. It's a lot of effort and a lot of back and forth. And that's the process. Let's talk about monetization. Cause you do, did mention that you are monetized. You are making money. This is what you're doing for a living now. What are your monetization buckets and like, how do you make money and if you could give us like obviously not exact numbers but maybe just like a ballpark of maybe what you do in a month or a day or whatever you'd like to do so the main bucket or whatever of income is through patreon and i started that super early on i want to say i probably had like 10,000 subscribers might have even been more like five. I really don't know. But I started that super early on. And I was just like, hey, if this comes in, into anything, I won't regret having started. And at the time we were like super penny pitching on like a associate pastor salary. Like we could use any kind of help. And that started and it was super successful. Just right off the bat, I think like day one, I got like 10 people joined and I was like, this is life changing. We can actually fill up our entire tank in our car with gas, and, you know, whatever it I, is. If I can ask a follow-up just to that point there, the 10 people, like when you say they signed up for your Patreon, what was it, was the price they were joining at, was it like a $5 tier, a $25 tier? I see that you have multiple tiers and people who know Patreon know how this works, fan funding. And that's the beauty of you having such a great community on your channel is that it shows here on Patreon that you've got over 4,000 members. Now, some of those might be free, obviously, but a lot of those are paid. When you got those first 10 members, did you calculate in your head, oh my goodness, that's like over a hundred bucks that I just made each month. How, how did, give us the feedback of that. I remember very clearly it was $53 and I ran into the kitchen and I was crying because I said, we can get groceries. We have some food allergies that really make our groceries really expensive. And I was just so grateful for that was like two, I think it was like two weeks, our budget for two weeks of groceries at the time when we, there's like a whole, so many stories, but rice and beans were what carried us through some rough months. And so I, yeah. I think it was $53. I think it was like about 10 people. Maybe it was like nine or eight. And that was life changing. But yeah, so now I have, I've always had actually three tiers. It's a $5 tier, a 
$12 tier and a $25 tier. And I try and give them like as much as I possibly can in mm. there on Patreon because they have changed the game for me. That's how I can employ editors and people to help me with emails and stuff like that is because of Patreon and give to other ministries and things like that. And I give them a vlog every week and a typically it's two Bible studies every week and we go live and we do all different kinds of studies and stuff. And I just try and give them like more content than they can even possibly consume because I just want to make it super worth it for them. Yeah. Um, and so yeah. you have the Patreon plus I assume the ad revenue on YouTube. How is monetizing faith-based content? I haven't talked to a faith-based creator in a long time. Early on really? in the show, I had a couple on the podcast and back then it was fine. There was not a problem with doing any of, of that kind of thing. So I would assume you don't run into too much trouble trying to monetize the faith-based stuff, do you? No, and I'm sure one day that will happen. And just to be super real, there's not much there. I remember when I made like a dollar in a month and I was like, whoa, but that was like when I was getting like 30 views a video. I'm trying to think like, it's probably 10% of what my business brings in a month. So that doesn't even cover like employees or anything, but it's still like nice. It's still just like icing on the cake. I don't monetize Instagram and TikTok. And those actually have, I think, more followers than YouTube. But I know a lot of people have expectations there as well. I would just say like when you put out content, don't necessarily assume that the views will pay the bills, but rather those views should lead them to something that might pay the bills. Yeah, so. I know that the Patreon for me for the podcast was something that I realized that I never had a problem even from like year three or four getting sponsors on the show. But the, the thing that I wanted was I wanted something that I owned, that I knew that every month I had the – now – it was going to be, it was going to ebb and flow just from the nature of it. But the Patreon for my podcast gives people for five bucks, they get a, a mastermind group of creators and I facilitate that through the podcast. And I only make four, five, six hundred dollars a month. So it's not like I'm getting rich off of it, but it's that I own, right? Like I, I, when I can control that and I've formed some friendships and some relationships through that and giving them value really in that Patreon has really grown over the past six to eight months and I can see it continue to do. So I love that. I love that you're talking about that. And I also would assume assume when you're doing faith-based content, it's like anything, right? The the amount you're making per thousand views is a lot different than me on my channel because I cover technology tutorials. So for me, those companies are paying a lot more than say a Bible company or a, a company that does like a Christian camp or something of that nature. So it's good. It's going to just differ depending on the niche that you're in. So I appreciate you being so transparent. Now you mentioned like emails and things like that. Are there other things that you've done outside of YouTube that obviously YouTube's the main cog in the wheel, but are there any other buckets per say it's the, the, the analogy that I like to use, like affiliates or selling products, like what else do you do? Yeah. So then I have this whole slew of digital products and I use Sam cart for that. It's okay. But I sell courses in a Bible reading plan and these things I call like the cliff notes to the Bible. They summarize each book of the Bible and give people like tips on how to study it and stuff. Basically just helping people go deeper in their Bible studies. And that's again, where I spend most of my time is building those out and just giving as much possible value as possible to the people who buy it, because I don't take it for granted. Like I'm well aware that they can go listen to a free sermon online. And so if they're going to put their money behind me and like really want to learn from me, then I'm going to, study more yeah. than a pastor does for his sermon. Like, like I'm going to give it my best, I guess. I talk a lot about email newsletters <laughs> on this podcast. You yeah. do a great job. As I was doing research for this show, one of your pages linked from your YouTube channel is your email newsletter, where basically you say, you know, send me the Bible study. So they give you their email address. You send them a free Bible study and you go ahead and get them in your ecosystem. That's a perfect, what I call uh, call to action that you've done there to get them in your audience. You know what they want. And so you give them something for free or the freebie is what I like to call it. And it gets yeah. them in the system. How many, if you don't mind sharing, like how large is your email list now? Because that's a very powerful thing. I believe it's just under 30,000 people on there. Yeah, that's powerful. That's a really powerful thing. And you own that, right? Like you yeah. pay ConvertKit or whatever you use to be able to have these emails that go out weekly or biweekly or monthly or whatever it is. And that's powerful. I want creators that listen to this to know that Faith took her niche and her space, knew her audience. Last week, I talked to a crafter. She called her target person Phyllis. It doesn't matter what you want to call your target person, right? Just knowing them will help you to facilitate the things like the 
the email newsletter. All right, as we're getting a little bit long here, I want to ask you in conclusion, what's next for the channel? Like what the How to Fate the Life channel and brand, what is next for you short term and long term? What do you have planned? We're working on building out physical products in the next year or so. So that's really exciting, but it's new ground for me. I just think diversifying and really just honestly meeting my audience where they want to be met. They're always asking for references to specific tools to use right. in their Bible studies and stuff like that. And why not just do that myself? I had so many brands ripping me off or using me to plug their stuff. And I finally realized like, I don't even like it that much. I'd rather just build something that's perfect. I actually do this. I, I know what's needed. And so that's what we're working on. And we'll see what comes from it. I'm obviously like super nervous because digital products are so easy. They are. Um, there's no upfront cost basically other than the software, but so yeah, that's the big thing for me. And also just making it sustainable because like I said, like I mentioned multiple times, I'm so passionate about like, giving it my all and doing my best. And that means I'm burning the candle from both ends most days. And then also trying to be present with my boys when I close off my computer and be present in my marriage and all the things and serve elsewhere. And so I think finding balance to make it sustainable and something I can do until retirement is like always my passion and something I'm constantly thinking through, bringing through, et cetera. So those are like my big two focuses. I love that. And Faith, I'm so thankful that you're willing to come on this podcast today. It's so nice to chat with you. You have so much knowledge, a breadth of knowledge to share. And I cannot wait to maybe have you on in a couple of years in a follow-up episode where we talk about those physical products. But thank you again. All of Faith's links will be her website, YouTube channel, everything will be in the link in the show notes of this episode. But we really appreciate it. And we'll talk to you next time. Thank you.